Welcome back to the Shared Practices podcast. We are in a three-part series with Dr. David Maloli on his framework on leadership and self-development, how to lead a team, how to run your practice. Dr. Maloli, welcome back. Hey, man, it's an honor. I, I really have enjoyed our all of our previous conversations dating back, I don't know, five, six years. So it's fun to continue the journey. Absolutely. This, this is a blast. This is, this is right up my alley. So um, this next episode, this topic we're talking about next, we, if you haven't listened to the first episode, go back and listen to that one. That gives you the overarching framework of personal people practice. What's the first one? Did I get it right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Okay. They're a mastery process. And it's really what we talked about before is just falling in love with a journey and knowing that there's no upper limit. It seems daunting at first, but this is how we stay on purpose and end up in a trajectory that we feel like it just can continue to get better, more time freedom, more financial freedom, more meaning. We're extracting all of those things as we're building an enterprise that really serves a team and a, and a, a group of patients that uh, really is in, you know, in a trusting relationship with us. Okay, so this this middle section, people, is about leadership, about leading a team. Um, and, and like I said on the last episode, um, in season five on leadership, uh, culture and change, my biggest worry was the fluff. Hmm. And, and we brought, you know, we, we dissected through the fluff on the last episode for the personal development. Help us dissect the fluff, uh, fluff and, and be a, a better leader and figure out, okay, where, where do I need to improve? Where can I self-diagnose and make some changes and get some feedback? How, how do you go about that? So what we're really talking about is influence. And if you really start to understand influence, being a parent is as sim very similar to a case acceptance with a patient is very similar to leading a team and aligning a team. And so that these are the concepts that we're talking about that are universal concepts. And so I, like we talked about in the last episode, I like to make things really simple. I'm just a, a farm hick from Nebraska and and the wise man Einstein said, make things as simple as possible, not simpler. And I think we as intelligent people, as dentists, add complexity and sophistication to things that's unnecessary. Sure. And if I'm going to boil down, and this is a, a, a very candid discussion that I've had with my teams many times, is that if we're showing up to this business, what, what makes a dental business? And I think it has three pillars. Goodwill, also known outside of dentistry as service excellence, case acceptance, also known outside of dentistry as sales, mm. and team building, which in my opinion, drives growth. If I can get the people, my people to grow, the bottom line, top line, all the other things become a natural byproduct without the money chase. And now we're respecting hum the humanity of the patient and, and the team and not leaving them what we typically think of as leadership is actually management where it's command and control. This is about choice and change and really diving into a human need that all of those people have. And it's not just a paycheck. So there's lots of places we can go, but I consider this taking people from disloyal to dedicated. That's the, that's the objective here. So we talked about point A would be disloyal. We talk about a lot of dentists, their number, their chief concern is losing patients and losing team members and always having to market and always having to rehire and retrain. Mm. Once we start to understand this, we see this as see that as unnecessary. If people leave, it's a blessing because now we're clear and they're they're just not aligned. It's fine, right? Easier said than done in a mature business. In the early stages, sometimes you have to swallow some bitter pills as you learn this. But this people mastery is to take people from Point A, disloyal to dedicated. Again, a trend line that never has to end. That gives us unlimited upside, like no upper limit. That's what the, the whole model is designed to do. So um, I'm getting pretty passionate. The three drivers, the three activators are goodwill, case acceptance, and growth here. Okay, so goodwill, case acceptance, and growth. Goodwill. How That seems a little nebulous to me. How, how do you define that? And, and how can we measure that? You know, how can we improve that? What, what is that if you're to sum that up for us? So to me, goodwill um, is what we think of as our reputation in the community. Mm -hmm. Our mission in the practice was to create trusting friendships with our patients, A, and inspire them to a lifetime of healthy, beautiful smiles. To me, that was goodwill and case acceptance. Mm -hmm. And 
if we're going to level up and integrate this into team building, like we know patient for patient, generally speaking, it's subjective. If we've met their expectations, if we've not met their expectations, or if we're exceeded their expectations. So at a bare minimum, it's making sure that we're in trust and rapport with the patient. If we're not in trust and rapport, the chances of us react, you know, keeping them in recare cycles and things like that have gone down. The chances of referrals and reviews is zero. So at a baseline, it's building trust and rapport with all of our patients. I call that trusting friendships. The next level is surprise and delight, giving more than what they give them more than what they wanted. And I just talked to uh, a, a guru, guru in management. His name's Kim Corn. He's developing a model called regenerative management, and it's science based. He and, and another guy, Joe Pine, are looking at how do we make a, a business last forever. How do we we see so many when we optimize for money? We see these big businesses they go up and they crash. They go up and they crash because there's no more juice left. They squeezed it all out. But this model allows us to be to humanize the team and the patients. And this is where we really get masterful at delegation is making sure that your team knows, hey, take an opportunity to surprise and delight them. Do they, do they watch ESPN every time they come in? Do they watch the Food Network every time they came in? Is there a note on that? Do, does the doctor know that they just got back from Vancouver? And I can mention that. All of those sorts of things are deposits in their emotional bank account. You may not surprise and delight them, but there might be a cumulative effect. So this really needs to be delegated to the team to make sure that they know that every conversation, every appointment, we're trying to surprise and delight. And this goes back to Joe Korn's model is that we have to treat customers in our, in our vernacular patients as individuals. And so to make this a metric is almost impossible, but yet there's this one-on-one -on -one interaction going on all day long where you know, you know, if I were to quiz you, like, did that patient leave happy? No, not so much. Did that patient, is that patient going to refer their, their husband? No, I don't think so. Or right. Like I, I expect a five-star review this evening. So this is really where we start to leverage our team building and making sure that we're turning them not into followers, but actual leaders where they own a zone and they create an experience for the patient. Um, you know, at, at, at the at the foundation, it's reputation, but we also have to appreciate that your you as the doctor's reputation is often eroded by the people you employ. So to make sure that they know that they're we're we all win or we all lose, and we all we all have established a trusting friendship or we haven't. This is where um, you're starting to manage the individual experiences without a whole lot of uh, touch from the from the doctor because you've delegated that off to someone else. And I feel like a dentist who cares about their energy, who dentist who cares about playing the long game must be on a trend line to get everything off their plate. That doesn't look like something that requires a dental license, mm. CEO activities and things that give you joy. So joy means it's, it's recharging you. So some people like lab work, like not me, some people like technology, not me. So I delegated all of that that because I was very clear of this is going to shorten my day week focus saying yes to this is saying no to this. And for me, like the assistant or the hygienist, they did 80% of the lifting. And, you know, I, that we, this gets a little bit into case acceptance, but if we've, if we've built the reputation, we think of case acceptance as a moment oftentimes, but we have to appreciate how they heard about us matters. What they, what they saw, smelt, heard, felt before the doctor walks in the room matters. Mm -hmm. And so this is an on-ramp, a continuum that makes case acceptance either really easy or really impossible. So it really could all be one word, which is case acceptance. But if we've not, if we're marketing in slimy ways, if our team isn't built around a certain experience, then case acceptance, the next step becomes this transaction um, when most of us really got into dentistry to help people. And I think now is a time where people are skeptical, they're scared for all sorts of different reasons. And to think the person that doesn't watch news and, and a political agendas isn't the same person that comes and sits in your chair and that's just the dental person is a delusion. Like you have to appreciate 
that people are on guard and the antidote to that is trust. And if you can get your team on board with that concept of, have you established trust and rapport? Okay, now it's time to go into surprise and delight. Then you can really enroll your team because they all have signature moves. Like Stacy, uh, who is my office manager, she kept a case of Prosecco under the front desk. And if somebody had an anniversary, a big case finish, like how good does that make Stacy feel to say, hey, listen, congratulations. This is a gift from me. Like that that's an amazing experience. And I've now checked the box on autonomy for the team member and surprised and delighted a patient. And I've done nothing mm. because the fundamental of leadership is if they build it, they back it. That wasn't, that wasn't my system. That was Stacy's system. Mm. So this is where you start to see all three of those integrate and where you're serving the patient, you're serving the team member and you're serving the practice simultaneously. Okay. So there, once again, there's so much good to unpack here. Um, so trust and rapport is the foundation of that goodwill. And then you surprise and delight. Um, one of my, my, my knee jerk reactions to that as a dentist is like, man, I wish we were in a different industry. Like surprise and delight in dentistry is so hard to do because it's not a pleasant experience in a lot of ways. Um, and, 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 and I guess the, the other, the flip side of that is a lot of people come with fear and anxiety and they've had bad experiences. And so if you can just have a, above average experience that can be surprising and delightful unfortunately the bar is not high there <laughs> right so so in some or ways unfortunately depending how you're looking at it yeah right they're like oh they're expecting the worst coming into the dentist mm -hmm. um that that seems hard to do to surprise and delight patients and to get your team members on board with that mindset so you, that was a great example you just shared that came from a team member who I don't even know what that, I'm assuming that's alcohol. I haven't heard of it before. Prosecco. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. sparkling wine, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so uh, do you have any other examples? I, I, I loved that example. Do you have other examples either in your office or in other offices of things that people do or that team members come up with to surprise and delight patients? Um, well, as a dentist, like the ultimate surprise and delight is the, a painless injection. Mm. Um, but a lot of this is an or, like an aura that your practice starts to develop when you're always the trusted advisor for the patient. So some of it's tactics and some of it's just how you're presenting because people's BS meter is in high alert. That's the byproduct of a distrust trusting society, right? So if you if you're able to say, "Hey, listen, like I think this tooth eventually needs crowned. If it were my mouth, I don't think I would do it right now, but just know if there's any symptoms, you need to call us right away because it's not going to get better. But I want you to see this big amalgam. I think it's got some more miles on it, but it's not scientific. So please let us know. We'll check on it next time. So now you've built a lot into that very simple conversation. Mm. You're not over treating. You're allowing the patient to be to make a decision. They can say, if you, you can say, if you'd like me to do it now, I can. They won't. But now you've given them autonomy. You've also given them a reason to come back. All of those sorts of things starts to permeate the culture of the practice. And that's, this is what I call a culture of confidence. When you, your team is having these conversations without you, the trust is immediately higher because, you know, your, your patient thinks it's going to tuition or a boat or a big vacation. A thousand dollar crown is going right into your pocket. They don't know the economics of a dental practice. So that's the other reason to have your team do all of the conversation is because they know that, you know, I mean, it's common to hear uh, a team member say, um, okay, I don't understand what he just, what he just said. What, what did what that dentist just mean by that? Right. So if they're staging all that and you're just confirming, like that's a completely different conversation. So set, how you set up the TV monitor, making sure that there's personal notes so that you're, you're, you're acting like you remember, even though you may not. The making sure that most of the conversation isn't about teeth, making sure that it's about them and not you. All of these things really lay that foundation because it's not normal. It's so atypical that that a few seeds here and there go a long way. But like the surprise and delight, the hey, let us let us take care of that. Hey, um, this is where where you start to enroll your team. And I mentioned it before, but I can't overstate it. If they build it, they back it. If you build the system, 
you end up having to audit, babysit it. Hey, are we still doing that? All of those sorts of things. So allowing them to create their own system, their own signature moves. I'm doing a workshop for a dental practice, and that's going to be a body of the work that we do. If you're going to, if you're going to optimize for surprise and delight, what are the few things that you can just go to again and again? Or is it is your batting average going to be 1,000? No, but if it's you know like in baseball. 300 will get you in the Hall of Fame. Like it's way better than anything in your marketplace because they're not having this discussion. The doctor is the bottleneck and they're running behind and they're in there with for 20 minutes, but it's half bake attention. All of these things go into this idea of trust and rapport. And you just have to hire conscientious people. Mm. People who are there for more than a paycheck. And that, we can talk about that in team building because they need a reason to come into work more than a paycheck. So if you're mission is see all the patients, you've immediately eroded the ability for this to be an effective tool in your practice. Okay. So let's get to that in a second. Let's go to case acceptance now. So you, you mentioned this idea. I love the analogy of like your team rolling a rock up a hill and you just come in and you push it right over the, the final little hump of the hill rather than, you know, team hasn't warmed them up. They haven't had any of these conversations. They haven't talked about anything that's going on in their mouth. And all of a sudden you come in and you're like, Oh, what do we got going on here? And, uh, the patients are kind of recoiling from, uh, all of this bad news that that's, you know, all of a sudden coming from nowhere. Um, how, how do you do that? How do you get a team to be doing the, the majority of the case acceptance work rather than the dentist? Um, Again, very simple. I think when, when a dentist walks in the room, if a patient knows the problems and they know the consequence, consequences of not treating it, the stage has been completely set. Hmm. A, a, a seasoned team member can say, what I train my team to say is like, if they didn't know, is to overstate the problem. So I think Dr. Maloli is going to want to do a crown here. Just be prepared for that. This is what I'm seeing. This is the problem. If this tooth cracks, you could lose the tooth. You could have a sleepless night on Thanksgiving Eve when you can't get a hold of Dr. Maloli. So this is this is from marketing. You you create a problem and then you twist the knife. And it's not to be slick because we as stress advisors for the patient know that it's not never less expensive, less painful, less time consuming than doing it today. It's efficient way of translating that to them. Mm. Because how often did dentists have upset patients because they knew there was a problem, but they didn't know the magnitude of the problem. And then it blew up and they ended up in some other dental office when you were in Cancun and on it goes. So you're actually preventing problems. So I'm all of these tools are highly powerful, but they have to have the foundation of integrity. That's why I always start with trust. Um, and so if they've, whatever it takes, again, this is a customized process. So I know we like the cookie cutter approach because that's how our dental procedures are. We use tried and true systems, but an engineer needs 10 times the information than the patient who was referred to you 20 years ago. And it's like, you're the doc. So if you don't customize that process, you're insulting one or the other. And so if they make sure that the patient understands the problems, they understand where they're winning. These, this all looks really good. So always start with the wins. You've started with a rapport and then you start with the wins and then you build out the problems and you show them whatever it takes, models, intro pictures, x-rays. And then you say, I'm afraid that if you don't take care of this, this is what happens. The term I always used is ticking time bomb. Like, I don't know. It could go off tomorrow. It could go off in a week. I think we should get this done sooner than later. Not, not if it wasn't true, but there's a lot of issues that like that DO becomes a root canal buildup and crown pretty quick in some cases, right? Yeah. So it's just straight talk. And I always think about what if my immediate family was in the chair? If my mom, would I let that go out the door? No way. Like I would say whatever it took. And so it gives you, going back to confidence and clarity, it gives you the ability to say, hey, listen, like if this was my mouth, if this is my mom's mouth, this is what I would do. And it gives you the ability to, to talk about future problems. So you start seeing all of these ab fracks and you know, you have the curse of knowledge. You know what that looks like in 20 years. But if you realign those teeth, that's an investment. That's not an expense. You've saved that patient's money. So it's this mental framework of I'm their trusted advisor. And if I'm their trusted advisor, if my financial advisor didn't tell me I was invested in this 
in this portfolio that was going to plummet tomorrow and they knew it, I would lose my mind. Mm. And yet we do that all of the time because we're people pleasing and we don't want to oversell. We don't want to hear no and we don't want to oversell and overstate it. But this is a completely different paradigm where you're just saying like, my, my case acceptance after that is plan A, take it, plan B, leave it. Like, I, I, I'm not twisting any arms. I've, we've been that clear that you, and we've built the trust and we've been that clear that this is going to be as affordable, easy on your schedule and, um, painless as possible now. And if we wait, I don't know, anything could happen. If your team can do that, you're, you're, you're in there for, uh, a, a small talk session. And then if, if that's already been done, scheduling and financial arrangements are just a formality. That's awesome. I, I love that. I love the framework. I love the the way of conveying that. And then almost the takeaway of like, ultimately, it's up to you. Like this, here here's the solution. Here's how you can avoid paying more, being more in pain and being more inconvenienced. Um, if you want to take care of it, I'm here. Otherwise, uh, uh, that's in, the ball's in your court. Um, I, I also... Yeah, yeah. And this comes from a really timid salesman. Like I, the last thing I ever wanted to be was the oversell guy. And so I undersell, but it comes with a ton of candor, not delivered by me. And to me, like if I'm walking into a dental practice, like if I go into a restaurant and the chef tells me something's awesome, that's different than the mater d' or the or the or the server telling me something's awesome. Yeah, and to me, this is the same environment. Like. I, I don't know anything about getting my car repaired, but I know when I go in there that I'm scared they're going to sell me something I don't w- need, not because I can't afford it, just because I don't want to be a sucker. And this creates an environment where nobody has to feel like a sucker. Right. Absolutely. We've been talking about case acceptance and, and we've brought up this this last term of team building and this idea of taking someone, a, a team member, a patient from being disloyal to dedicated dedicated okay i couldn't remember the other term so how do how do we go about that what what um what can flip the switch for people where they're like i want to be in this practice as long as this practice is is still standing i want to be here um that that seems hard to do are you talking from a patient perspective let's say from a team team perspective okay um this uh the research shows that you have to tap into their internal drivers so Throw out your bon- your magic bonus systems, throw out your collision conversations, throw out your um, quarterly evals, and let's reinvent that, right? So they need to know what the practice is, what it stands for. And so I refer to that as envision. That has to come from the dentist largely. Mm-hmm. But I, I went back to this concept of if they build it, they back it. The mission is mine. I'm always here. It's mine. The vision is largely mine. But the values, the culture code, I can have my team help me build that. And what happens when they're involved in that discussion? Their buy-in has just become a multiple. What happens in that discussion? Now the two hygienists that didn't get along see each other as peers because why this person comes to work is different than why this person comes to work. Hmm. And so now you're creating an environment where they know they can't get this anywhere else. And then you start to build out them give them skill sets and confidence so that they can be a leader they've now are the ceo of op one op two the phones the statements all of those sorts of things and you've empowered them as el presidente of this thing and surely they have to report to you but they've built the process you've you've had a discussion of what this looks like when done and done well and then you're constantly coaching them to their next level and so this is where growth comes in this is where Uh, what Kim Corner would call regenerative management comes in is like, there's no upper limit to human potential. And if you continue to get them on a confidence curve, they start to know like two bucks down the road doesn't pay for this. That's just a paycheck. I got a paycheck and this and this and this. And this isn't for everyone. This is for just top players. So what we call C players classically will jump off because you're saying like, what, what are you focused on? What growth steps are you focused on the next 90 days? and allowing them that autonomy. So what I'm getting at um, is the three human drivers of mastery. So the ability to consistently get better at your job and they don't see a glass ceiling there. Autonomy, meaning 
Doc isn't going to be looking over my shoulder all the time. There's feedback loops. There's auditing systems. He's looking at reports. He may ask me questions, but this is mine. And purpose. Purpose is when you start to align a person's reason to go to work other than a paycheck with the practice's purpose, just like you've done that for yourself. So there's some things you can't negotiate, but I've had arguments with smart business people of like, how can you delegate that? And I'm like, what's the cost if you don't? What's the cost? I mean, you're just going to police this forever? No, you want to be a better dentist. You want to spend less time doing this. So there, there is a, a trust that has to be built there and you can get burnt. But again, what happens if you just have a team of of square pegs and square holes. Like this is management. This is control and compliance. And once you teach them that they can rise as leaders of something and develop that skill set of developing conf- confidence, they don't want to go anywhere else. They go because they move. They go because they want to spend more time with their family, but they don't go, they don't leave for another job because it's like we talked about the patient experience. It's so who's willing to put this into to build out an explicit culture and police it. I mean, that's what a CEO does is build the mission and vision, build a team to support the mission and vision and give them the tools and training to succeed. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. But yet we complicate it with all of this, like, oh, I have to build the system. Oh, I need a consultant to build the system. Like you're, this is control and compliance that you'll never, you'll get a, you'll get a team member to show up, but you won't get their heart and soul. You won't, get them referring their best friends and family members. You won't get their loyalty. You won't get them to stay for the six o'clock emergency that just walked in. This is what it takes. You're giving them something that they didn't know was possible. And you're teaching them what really spreading your wings looks like. So I I love this idea. And you mentioned, uh, I can't remember if there's this episode or last episode, the, the annual meeting with your team where you're building this culture code. Take us into that moment in in that exercise. How do you open this up? Like, how do you say, what do we want to be about? What do we want our culture to be? How do you bring that out of people? Um, and 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 what's an exercise that a dentist could do to establish and and help their team establish a culture and an expectation and a practice? So I think the the foundation is that dentists think they have to be that good leadership is being more charismatic, being more uh, clear. I, I just need to be more clear about my expectations. Like this is industrial age stuff. Like mm-hmm. it works until it doesn't. So if you think that it's going to work for the next 10, 20 years, like it's it's completely time to evolve. What really works in these meetings is being a facilitator. You have to take the wallflower that never wants to talk and make them know that their voice matters and it's needed and it's necessary. And typically, in any time you're trying to shift an organization, you'll have thirds. You'll have a third that's completely bought in, a third that's completely resistant, and a third that can go wherever the critical mass, they're, they're on the teeter-totter. And if, if the, uh, the law of averages pulls them down into the skeptic, that'll go that way or this way. But assuming that you've already have this built out and it's non-negotiable for you as the dentist, now you're starting to get momentum into the buy-in piece. But you also have to give them a voice, and that's that's where buy-in happens. Is like your voice matters. I'm I'm not the all-knowing, all-being. Um, this empowerment concept comes from I'm the king. I've given you power. This is more about engagement. So this these conversations have to be very facilitated. And as a rule of thumb, what I guide doctors is that if you're speaking more than twenty percent of the time, you're doing it wrong, and it's hard. It's hard because you may have the ideas, but you making their ideas better removes them from the process. So you have to know what your objective is going into this meeting. Um, if I were going to give a quick agenda, it would be one, get a dialogue about how we won last year. So we start by kind of infusing energy into the, the meeting. So we start on a very positive note, we're infusing energy. Then reflect on the mission. The mission should already be established. Mine was non-negotiable. It never changed from day one one on. Um, Then I would talk about the vision. So this is what I expect. And this is what I expect of 2020. And usually it would just be one or two things because I wanted them to add the list. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was double Invisalign cases. Sometimes it was 
Um, I remember one time the hygienist said they wanted ninja case acceptance language. So they were good, but they wanted to be great at making sure that the patients knew the problems and the consequences of not treatment. So I've set that frame. I've set the where we are, where we've been, where we are, where we're going. And this is where I start to have them talk about the values. And there's been some prep here. I give them a sheet of like 200 or so values and I have them come with the ones that are the most important to them. And in that discussion, they all come with a few values. I document them and we start to have a discussion. I facilitate a discussion. Okay, I see truth here. I can see integrity here. Are those the same to you? No, it doesn't mean the same to me. Why doesn't it mean the same to you? And you start to have this robust conversation of what's really important to people. And the process is just important as the result. And then you start to distilling it down. And the end point of this long story short is that you're coming up with one value for every team player and they're the champion of that value for the year. Mm-hmm. You write it down, you post it where you have your huddles and you as the leader recognize when you see this as an action. This becomes the drum that you're beating all year long, but it's not difficult because you're just aligning the team with what they told you that they wanted. Mm-hmm. So it's not it's not a prescription. So it's a very important meeting and it needs to be done right. But if they've had... Now they start to see you as, as your board of advisors. They start to see you as executives in the organization. You're starting to give them more autonomy. So they start to see themselves as leaders and owning their zone. Um, then the next question where we start to build out the culture code is I usually start with a joke like, hey, I know we all come to work for a paycheck. Um, if we win the lottery tomorrow, I don't expect anyone to come to work the next day. Like, I get it. Like, a windfall means you're not here. But I believe that we spend a tremendous amount of time with each other, in some cases more than or with our own family, and work should be more than just a paycheck. So the two guiding questions here are, on your best day of work, what gets you excited to come to work? And on your best day of work, maybe not the same day, but what has you leaving fulfilled? And that builds out a whole nother discussion. And you start to hear statements like second family, out loud laughter, all like I'm a hard driving dude. Like I, I like I just want to work, right? And sometimes that can show up as intensity. What they put on that manuscript, what they put on that slide deck was far better than the stuff that I came out with because it helped me see what what is success. Is it a bottom line activity? Like now, if they say, okay, the cue is out loud laughter. If I stand in the hall and I hear laughter from three operatories, that's a KPI for me. That right. means trust. Right. And so that's how you build out a highly facilitated, high voltage annual meeting to make sure that you're setting the sales and there's buy in before you even get started. Because what's hard is when you get started, you're like, oh, I thought we understood that. Oh, didn't didn't we establish this as the process? Like it's so chaotic and that's what costs us all this energy. And people inherently don't see this as investment. Like, yeah, I get it. Like seeing the crown prep and putting the fifteen hundred dollars in the bank makes sense today, but know that this puts out all sorts of fires. It's fire prevention really is what it is. And it creates a community where you start to like to work, come to work more. And what does that mean? If you come to like, I mean, are you more profitable? Are you more purposeful? Do you have more left at the end of the day for your family? This is where we start to get the flywheel where it like, it never really, as long as you continue to feed energy into the machine, like it just kind of keeps getting better with less and less effort. That's awesome. And that thank you for walking us through kind of the different phases of this this annual meeting, this culture code um because I it is so difficult to not be the one who just shows up and says, "Okay, this is our vision, this is our culture, this is our values, like let's do it." Rah, rah, rah. Um but you do that and it backfires. And and to build this up from the team up, you end up with something better, like you were saying, and with far more buy-in, far more heart, far more purpose. Um, let, and, me, and- let, me, let me tell you the best part of this that I forgot to mention. Yeah. It becomes a hiring tool because now if you have this on a one pager and somebody comes in for an interview, you hand this to them, either their eyes light up or they roll mm-hmm. and you know who you're hiring because some people have been looking for this all their life. And some people just want to know how much you pay and what the benefits package is. Right. Like another thing is this becomes the immune system. The last three people that I let go, I don't even know that I fired them. Like it was like this, 
the team said, Hey doc, like you're giving them too much. Like I, I know you're bought into their success, but like, it, it's not going to work like months before. And then they, they, they start to slowly eject into the system and you start putting more and more pressure on them to live up to the standard. And they finally say like, no, I'm going to go serve sushi. That's what happened to one. Like literally that interaction was so peaceful. There was no animosity. There was no drama. It was just like, I'm not the right fit. And it was very clear because now we know what a fit is and what a fit isn't. Mm. You're not hiring for experience. You're hiring for alignment. And it, it just makes, if you don't have that roadmap, then it's easy to be all these vectors pointing in other directions, which is again, the most exhausting thing. That's amazing. And, and that ability for your office to kind of become this organism that, that um, attracts more people like it and repels the people who aren't like it um, is, is when you truly have a culture rather than just what's the mood of everyone in the office today. And that's the culture. <laughs> that's the thing. Like this, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to bash on Dennis a little bit. Our skill set isn't in leadership. Our skill set isn't in entrepreneurship. So realize that the people you hire are the byproduct of, or two or three versions of low expectations, no processes, no autonomy, mastery, and purpose, no vision. You have to get them on board and train them. But if you, I got this from Patrick Lencioni, if you screen for hungry, humble, and smart, all of this you can provide for them. However, if they're not, if they come in with an ego, what's in it for me, like you can't enroll that person into a system. You can't because they're worrying what, when's quitting time. Like I'm not staying late. I'm doing too much in sterilization. All this gossip and drama comes from that person. So now you have a screening tool uh, and an alignment tool that's super, super powerful. And the ones that don't belong just don't stay. It's not dramatic. It's just like they find their own, they're liberated, right? Everyone's liberated at that point. Yeah, no, that's um, hungry, humble, and what was the last one? Smart. Smart, when he's talking about isn't naturally national, um, isn't intelligence like high intellect, it's emotional intelligence, understanding like this is how I connect with the engineer. This is how I connect with grandma. This is how I connect with a seven year old. And you're not being this puppet, this chameleon that we typically are. You're just coming from a place of service. Like these are the non negotiables, but this is where I'm bridging the gap to make sure that I have the trust and rapport and then the upgrade to surprise and delight. I, th this this has been awesome. This this has been so good. I love this framework, this process. Um, let's let's arc it from the the beginning to the end. So we're we're taking people from disloyal to dedicated. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the the three ways we look at this, we look at the goodwill. Mm -hmm. uh, so we want to uh, start with the foundation of trust and rapport, mm -hmm. and then whenever we can, surprise and delight on top of that. Um, we want to uh, build case acceptance that's uh, a team effort and that we're, you know, the team's almost over, not over, uh, is, is letting them know before you walk in the room, worst case scenario, so that when you come in, you have the option to, to back down from that or to let them know what you're seeing and they're prepped for that. Yeah, the worst case scenario is that they understate it and then you come in like, everyone looks like a, like a liar at that point in time. So that is super important if when, when in doubt overstate, because if you understating and say, Hey, listen, I think we can get by with a filling there. Then everyone's a hero. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, the overstated or worst case scenario so that we can back up off that there were some more things there on case acceptance, but then the last piece is on the team building and the culture and, and how to empower your team to truly be, creating the culture, creating the mission and the purpose, uh, the vision of that practice. And, and, and you came with the vision and, and it's how we get there um, as a team and, and creating that sustainable organization um, with purpose and heart rather than just, I'm here for a paycheck. Thanks. Goodbye. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think you, if we're going to simplify it, dentists are really how people, and we have to break that model. I, I just had, um, Cameron Harold on on the show, and he's the world's leading expert on vivid vision and BHAG. And he stated it so simply as you paint the vi vivid vision, they create the path. If you're not clear enough on the vivid vision, then they won't be able to create the path. But you can't prescribe the path because then there's no buy-in. Then you end up babysitting all of these processes, and that's management. So leadership is about choice and change. 
And that's the only way you can move into rapid growth is to give some of that autonomy away. And that's engagement, not empowerment. Okay. So uh, I can't see how someone who listened to this episode doesn't have like at least three or four things that they can be working on uh, and improving. Cause, cause I know I a hundred percent, both of these episodes, I'm like, okay, I suck at this. I need to get better at this. Um, this last uh, topic, which is where dentists want to jump to. Everyone wants to jump the personal development. They want to jump the the second topic of of how to build a team, how to build this loyalty. Everyone wants to go to the how and the the practice management side. Um, so we're going to have you back for one more episode where we talk about some of the stuff in um, this season around growth. Uh, you know, you you turned me on to some some people early on in my my dental career that I didn't you know that aren't in the dental field who are excellent marketers who have systems and all these things. Um, but that's where everyone wants to go first. So now we're finally going to get there after we've worked on these other factors and uh, it's going to be exciting. So this, this is fun. Yeah, man, I appreciate it. Cool. Well, we will talk with you guys next time on the Shared Practices podcast. Tune in to hear part three with Dr. David Maloli. Talk to you next time.